Okay, everyone, we're gonna we're gonna introduce the next speaker. Um, we're, we we want to keep this thing on time here, so we're just gonna move right along. Um, Mark Williams is our next speaker, and Mark is falconer, traveler, photographer, uh, martial telemetry retired, and all around very uh, accomplished sportsman. And so please welcome Mark Williams. Thank you. I, I don't need that. Yep. Sorry. Technology isn't my forte. Can you believe that, working for Marshall Radio? But um, thank you. Um, good morning, ladies, gentlemen, fellow falconers, friends. In fact, I look across this room, there's some very familiar faces, and some of them which I consider family. Um, we are indeed a very close-knit community. Um, but that being said, there's a lot of faces here I don't know and I don't recognize, so I'll give you just a couple of more moments to introduce who I am. My name, as you, I was introduced, is Mark Williams. Um, I'm a falconer of some 45 years or so. Um, I'm British by birth, Canadian by choice. Um, and I emigrated to Canada in 1991 with my wife and then three-year-old daughter two hunting dogs and all my belongings that I could fit in a suitcase, six suitcases. And uh, there began a new life in a new country and uh, a decision I never regretted. Um, it, it's been an amazing um, experience and uh, I came primarily for the falconry. It's quite simple as that and I was very fortunate like many of us in this room to have a spouse that would support that because I would have missed her. Um, <laughs> but. <laughs> But, um, yeah, you can imagine I arrive in Saskatchewan, central Canada, middle of March, and there is no trees in Saskatchewan to speak of, and it was snow on the ground. And if anybody has seen pictures of a lunar landscape, that's Saskatchewan in the winter. But that being said, it's actually a very beautiful province, and it's probably the best province in the country um, to practice the art of falconry. Anyway, fast forward 15 years, moving around Canada, I ended up in a place I considered to be a balance of giving um, a great opportunity for a growing family. I since had a son when we arrived in Canada, so he brags as being the only true Canadian in our family. Um, and then uh, everything was great. I enjoyed falconry nirvana until one day I got an email from a gentleman who's in this room, and I know he doesn't like the limelight, but I'm probably gonna put him in a bit of an awkward spot anyway. Um, my Xbox, Robert Bagley. He sends me an email and says, you know, in a roundabout way, how would you like to represent our company in the Middle East? And it was like the most random, out the far left field kind of request. And like any good husband, I showed the email to my wife because that's the litmus test. And I said, uh, what do you think of this? And she's like, thinks for a moment. She was preparing supper. I remember it very clearly. She said, hell yeah, I'm mentally packed. Let's go. Now, I'm like, whoa, 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 slow down, <laughs> you know, and uh, it was January, so it was minus 30-something, um, so the idea of going somewhere warm was very appealing, and I think Robert probably timed it for that, um, but anyway, uh, before you know it, in 2013, we arrive in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, and um, I'm going to show you, I think you can see there, um, where the UAE is, and it says Abu Dhabi. Um, that is where we, we were in Dubai actually, but that's where we, we arrived. Didn't know anybody, and of course in this case, we emigrated a second time, but didn't know the language. And it was a bit intimidating and, and daunting, but uh, it wouldn't be the first time that in my life we've made a big leap of faith, and, and, and a lot of that was based on my belief and um, trust in Robert. And so um, there we were, and, and that's when uh, the real adventure started. And so bringing it back to, to now, what qualifies me to be here to talk to you today? Well, like many of uh, the esteemed pre speakers today, uh, I too have a PhD, but it's, it's past high school with difficulty. <laughs> um, I, I'm not, I don't have an education or so, but my education is actually in falconry. And so... Um, the last seven years of, of, of my working career in the Middle East was probably a defining 
point for me and, and rounded off a lot of my falconry experience. We never stop learning, but um, I really got to see a very different part of the world and a very different part of falconry. So, as you can see, um, the populations, I mean, the GCC is really the area that I looked after, but the GCC is Saudi Arabia, it's Kuwait, Bahrain, which is a tiny little island, virtually, uh, Qatar, which is not very big either. I mean, the population of Qatar is only 300,000 people. But by per capita, they're probably the richest people in the world because their wealth is shared and they have huge gas reserves as well as oil. And the, the, the citizens get a share of that wealth. Um, and then you see below there is the UAE um, and then Oman. Now, Oman is actually quite different. In fact, there's no falconry in Oman. It's illegal. Um, in fact, for that matter, it's also technically illegal in the UAE, but I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. Um, so, the cultural significance of falconry, it's... It, it, every family has a son, a brother, an uncle, a cousin, somebody who's a falconer. It, it's not just something very rare or remote, it's everybody's a falconer. You, you know, it's not unusual to see a car with falcons in it. Um, you know, if you're there, uh, a non-falconer, th th it's not a novelty for them to see a falcon, let's just say that. As you can see on every banknote, it depicts a picture of a falcon. Um, falconry, like in many parts of the world, has also been, um, uh, should we say, a, a key factor in political alliances, and I think two or three years ago, um, Putin was down in Saudi Arabia and giving some drill falcons to the king of Saudi Arabia. They are and always were used as a sort of a peace offering within cultures and countries. Um, but the evolution of, of hunting in the Middle East has certainly taken a huge um, change. And uh, with the advent of four by fours and powerful motors, and, of course, the introduction of captive bred birds, hybrids particularly, geoperegrines. Um, the face of falconry in the Middle East has changed quite significantly. Um, before, they would hunt on, uh, off camels. Um, but, but that's, frankly, a thing of the past. Nobody does at all. Um, and uh, the introduction of captive bred falcons has been uh, quite significant. Um, it shows there, for example, 8,500 are imported per, per year. That's just to the UAE. Now, you know, like it or not, we don't realize perhaps how much the Middle East has influenced our falconry and certainly captive breeding. And um, it just blows my mind that there are some, some breeding farms that will produce 1,000 falcons a year to ship. And many of the breeders, some of which may be in this room, have shipped falcons to other countries, particularly Spain, where they became the foundation and breeding stock for birds that are now being shipped to the Middle East. And Spain is by far the largest exporter of, of raptors in the world. They, they ship over 7,000 falcons a year. Um, however, that's coming to a head now. And uh, frankly, the, the market is saturated. Um, geofalcons, as most of us are aware, are probably more easier to breed than, say, peregrines. And um, there are many, many people breeding geofalcons, and there is, frankly, too many. Um, now it's got to the point where you can't actually sell them in the UAE or in the Gulf. Um, some countries like uh, Saudi Arabia are just experiencing geofalcons for the first time. They're very new to them. And they have predominantly used wild, wild birds, sakers and, and, and peregrines, shaheens as they call them. And of course, some of the other uh, subspecies like red nape shaheens and some barberies. Um, but what we've also seen is um, the diminishing of the, the wild, wild taken birds because of the captive bred birds. There is not actually as much use of, um, of trap birds as there used to be. Um, and uh, although there is still traditional trips to places like Mongolia for wild sakers, which are done supposedly under license with the government, and they pay $10,000, I believe, for a permit. Um, and then 
That money, I don't know where it goes, but I'm not sure it goes to Seca Conservation, to be honest. In fact, the UAE has been one of the biggest funders of Seca con Conservation in uh, Mongolia. Um, and the majority of the concerns and decline of Seca falcons, for example, has been through electrocution, through poorly designed power poles that cover that barren flat landscape and offer a very good hunting perch for a, a raptor. And I've been there myself, and I've seen them for myself at the bottom of these poles. And we worry about whatever it is, two or three hundred Seca's that are taken out of Mongolia, for example. There's thousands and thousands of them being fried every year off these poles, migrating through. Um, but also, culturally, hunting has changed and evolved from being a way of sustaining some protein, um, because Arabs and the Bedouin lifestyle up until maybe 60, 70 years ago, they lived off um, milk and dates and, of course, um, camel meat, sheep, goat. But um, before then, I mean, when they're traveling, those nomadic uh, tr tribesmen would, would use a falcon to hunt desert hare or hubara as a means of food. That evolved to becoming... Um, it became more readily available to everybody, and of course, um, it, 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 there is an element of competitiveness that, got, that came into it, which frankly had, um, in my mind, sort of tarnished it a bit, because now, all of a sudden, Abdullah's caught three Hubara with his Saker or Jir Falcon, and now Muhammad wants to catch four or five or six, and it's, it's their sort of way of outdoing their brother, their cousin, and so on. And so... Um, the cons conservation concept is very foreign, or was up until recent years, to, to Arab falconers. And they almost wiped out everything they had, including the oryx and the gazelles and, and so on. That, of course, has changed, thankfully, in, in recent uh, decades, because the, the, the leaders certainly recognize that and have brought some laws and changes to that. Um, the technology we've seen, drones, uh, RC planes, copters, um, at the time I went there, in fact, drones were just starting to, excuse the pun, take off. And they, I was kiting before I left, and then I was trying to do balloons and obtaining helium. It was a headache. Um, but we started using drones back 2013, which now I think a lot of people do. Um, but the Arabs were actually th the forefront of all that. And um, they they are always looking for ways to try and improve on what they do. Um, hunting has become more and more difficult for them because of the conflicts within the Middle East, and as we've seen now in modern day, in even places like Ukraine, but most of the stand countries have some form of conflict or difficulty in political times that, that prevents the Arab falconers from going to those countries to hunt. Um, so it's becoming increasingly more difficult. But at the same time, the, the, the leaders of these countries recognize that falconry is part of their cultural heritage. And they want to maintain um, th that heritage and to encourage people to own a falcon. Uh, so with that came the uh, falcon races. And the falcon races uh, have been going for maybe 10 or 12 years, maybe more. Um, but it's only in the last six, seven years that they've really started to take off. Um, and this gave people a reason to own a falcon, because otherwise they couldn't go hunting anywhere. Why do I have a falcon? Um, veterinary knowledge, uh, where is Ken? He's in the room, I'm sure. There he is. Um, you know, the, 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 the Arabs imported some of the finest veterinary knowledge in the world to their countries to, to treat these birds. Uh, and to care for them and to educate the falconers and, 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 and fal you know, Arabs in, in the care and husbandry of these birds. Um, most of the top vets in the world are in the Middle East right now working for a sheikh or, or some royal family member. Um, and women in falconry. I'm going to cover that in a moment. I can go. Wild birds. I touched on wild birds. This is a souk. And, and there are some souks, and this is in Qatar for the most part, I think. Um, but souks, they are where the birds come to be sold to the public, the, the falconers. And these souks are um, they're full of wild birds, mostly. There are, of course, captive bred birds that, that, that come there. 
Um, and a lot of these birds, frankly, are smuggled, usually from Pakistan. And some of them are trapped in Saudi, and, but mostly Pakistan. Um, they come via different routes, probably across from Iran, which is only like, I think, 70 miles from the, the, the border across the Persian Gulf. Um, but it, it's really not as prolific as one might think, or certainly that it used to be. Um, here you see the, the video is, is a, a falconry exhibition in Saudi Arabia, and all these birds are there for sale. Not all of them are wild, but um, people come, they see a falcon, they pick them up. It's, it's like a Walmart for falconry. It's just everything there. In fact, in those events in Adiax and Saudi Arabia, a lot of the big hunting companies go there, whether it's purdy shotguns, uh, Anything to do with hunting, you know, uh, shooting, falconry, they're there. And it's, it's, it's such a mind-blowing place to go to because um, you see things that you wouldn't see anywhere else in the world, certainly all under one roof. Um, the technology I talked about, they do like their toys. Um, I'm not sure if I can show you the videos in this. Um, if I can, is anybody able to show me how to operate one of these videos in my PowerPoint? Um, sorry, I would do it on my computer, but this isn't my computer either. It's so that one, for example. Oh, you just click on it with a mouse. Thank you. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so what we see here is one of the race competitors. He's actually the passenger in the car, thank goodness. He's operating a control set, and he's flying an RC plane that is beside the vehicle. That blue line represents the track of the Falcon that's flying beside the vehicle at about, a well, upwards of, at times, 120 kilometers an hour, chasing the plane, which has a lure on the back of it, and this is a fitness conditioning. And... Um, it's actually, well, that was 103 kilometers an hour that Falcon's doing in pursuit. And one of the things that I, I, I learned right away when I went to the Middle East is I, I prided myself as being a, a competent falconer, that my birds were fit. I hunted for the full six, seven months of the season, and I thought my birds were fit until I went to the Middle East. And then I saw stuff that blew my mind. And in fact, as a falconer, we, we don't really tap into the full potential of our birds. There's no question. Certainly long wingers, when you watch a falcon go up and take its time, it gets a pitch, and then we serve the game, it comes down, kills it, it's done. And we're happy with that. I'd be delighted if my bird took a high pitch, personally. But um, these guys, they will, for example, toss a pigeon, and then they'll get around to getting their falcon out of the truck, and I'm like, this, this pigeon's leaving town. Like, you, <laughs> you know, get going. And they, they're like, unhood the falcon, and then they release it. And now we jump in this truck and we're facing, racing across the desert at 100 and something kilometers an hour, chasing this falcon that's climbing at an amazing rate up to about 1,000 feet, chasing a pigeon. It's on its tail, like ching, 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 ching. And, and I'm like, you just don't see that. And of course, you couldn't do that here because we have fences and other landowners and stuff like that. But there you can get, do a lot of things. But it, it gave me a certainly an insight. You see the big drone there with a seagull that looks like being put in there. None of this would pass by a lot of the uh, animal rights people in, in this country or, or many other Western countries. But that seagull gets a VIP one-way tri trip to uh, about three or 400 feet up in the air. And then again, they release the falcon. Falcon climbs up. And this is to mimic a flight on a hubara, which are a big bird similar to the size of a sage grouse. And um, that's their prized main quarry. So the bird would leave, in this case, the truck going 70 kilometers an hour, fly up, chase, and hopefully over, overpower the, the, the hubara. Because hubara are, are rare, certainly wild hubara, and even captive bred hubara are very expensive to buy that only really the sheikhs can afford it. It's going to cost them about 1000 bucks for that baggie. Okay, So it's a lot of money when you start chucking those out to train a falcon. Um, so other birds are used. Some of them are seagulls, some of them are ducks, some are captive bred uh, hubara. And you can see the trailer below is full of toys. They've got two or three RC planes and so on. Um, and they go through quite a lot of these sometimes because they're training the birds and they crash them. Um, but money is no, no 
objection there. I mean, they, they, they do have all the best things for that. So um, if I can get to the next slide. Oh, what have I done? How do I get away from that answer? Thank you. Okay, so again, with the technology, you can see in this case the GPS system. This is in Azerbaijan, and we're trying to go over land that's not too dissimilar to some Western countries with these streams and rivers and so on. And in the old days, we used to just sort of hand out with a receiver and try and sort of figure out which direction our bird's gone. Now, we're able to, um, to pinpoint exactly where our birds are. And this is why manufacturers like, uh, and companies like Marshall Radio, uh, exist because they. I want to set that off. Yeah, you gotta go clear off this way. What? Because so, there's two screens. Do it. Oops. Step away from the machine. Want I want that one. That one? Yeah. So here we see, for example, a picture of a falcon chasing a hubara at quite an altitude, I might add. I mean, I look at this both as a falconer, but I also look at it as a photographer. To to achieve this footage, is is pretty incredible. Again, they've got. They've got helicopters with um, gimbal uh, cameras, you know, half a million dollar cameras on the front of the helicopter, videoing this like something off um, a David Attenborough show. But you can see the intensity of the flight, and the desert sands are way below. And uh, this bird is chasing this wild hubara, who's flying, of course, literally for its life. And, uh, and this is really what they, they, they strive for. It's, it's an incredible, incredible sight. And it's not our normal waiting on flights, but it's true pursuit falconry at its finest. Um, and I don't have much time to let you see all that video, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll press on. But it is pretty fascinating. Um, the, the Sorry, I'm back to the problem again. I need, you need to stand here. You need to stand here. I'll go behind the camera. You stand here. So you want to go to the next slide? Next slide, please. Thank you. This isn't working. Okay, here we go. Veterinary knowledge. As you can see, we have um, the Abu Dhabi Falcon Hospital there in the top left. Um, and um, the state-of-the-art equipment in, in these hospitals. In fact, this is belonging to a... Um, it's MRI is from a, a, a royal family member in Dubai. It's a, it's a miniaturized MRI machine that, that you know, would be seen in, in a hospital, but this is in some guy's private collection just to, to examine his birds and, and look beyond what an x-ray can see. Um, I hate to do this, but um, I'm going to touch. This is something pox. You see what's happening here. In fact, I was in Azerbaijan when we were doing this. This is with Geo Falcon. And what they're doing is, is they're treating pox. And um, there's different medications you can use. And I know a lot of us as Westerners look at that and say, oh, that's barbaric. But it's actually probably can. I mean, would you agree is probably one of the most successful ways of treating pox? You, you basically, you burn it, you brand it, and you kill the pox. Um, they get it from mosquitoes. And could tell us all about that, I'm sure. But um, it's not too uncommon. Uh, and this is one of the ways they treat it. So there's a balance of modern medicine and traditional and old medicine. Um, and one of the old medicines that I, I don't agree with, but this is what they call shenada. It's uh, ammonium oxide. What is it? Right. So look at that green phlegm. It doesn't look good. It looks like somebody's coughed up a Huey, but that's actually a falcon did that. And what they do is sometimes, you know, when we have a falcon that's... that's in high condition, we, some of us used to, I did, give a sugar pill in a capsule, castor sugar. It would help cleanse the crop and just, uh, this is far more caustic. In fact, I'm sure it removes certain layers of the stomach wall. But it certainly tunes in a falcon to be very sharp set. But it's not something I would condone. And whenever I could, I would encourage Arab falconers to not do that. Um, can we get to the next slide? Help me. Sorry. Oh, here we go. Did I go too far? No. OK, women in falconry. Um, all th the, the lady on the right is in Dubai. The other two are actually in Saudi Arabia. Um, full credit to Abu Dhabi Falconers Club, who have created a women's falconers club. And even now, Saudi Arabia, 
who are way behind in terms of, um, you know, should we say adopting the Western cultures and, and you know, women, women, and the perception is that women are not treated very well over there. In fact, it's quite the opposite. They are princesses. They are, they are God. You know, you go to a government building, there is a parking space for women. There's a lineup for women. They get treated way better than us men. Um, my wife loved it. You could just, you know, you were treated like a princess. You truly were. But in falconry, it's, there's steps towards it. And you'll see with social media, as there is in North America, it's easy to post a picture and create a perception. But reality is, we're still a long way from getting to the level that we are, certainly in the Western world, with women and participating in falconry. But the movement is there. And with time, hopefully, we will see that um, change. The next slide, you can see um, hunting both domestic and out of country. This is a pet passport, and this is something we should have in North America. It's something I think they had in Europe. Um, Tony and others will maybe be able to clarify it, but this basically allowed me to travel anywhere in the region with my falcon. I just get on a plane, I actually hold the falcon with me, and I can just go hunting in different places. Um, Local laws with regards to falconry, anyone can have a bird. You just go to the souk and buy one. Um, and the hunting aspect is the gray area. The quarry traditionally is McQueen's Bustard, uh, the, the Kirawan, which is a, a Eurasian stone curlew, and the desert hare, which is not much bigger than a, des than a, uh, sorry, a, a cottontail. Um, and so the, the problem is, is that actually hunting is Ill Ill illegal. You can't go out and kill a hubara, although people do do it. And I hunted them quite often with a royal family member who I became very close friends with and still am. Um, and so with him, it was okay, but I would never dare go into the desert and club a hubara and then risking court and then having an international incident, not the least embarrassing my employer. But um, there, there is, it does happen. Um, now, there is also, because of the fact there was not much hunting, there are hunting preserves. These are, there's at the moment three in the United Arab Emirates that um, have, it's a massive fenced area, and I think some of you who may have gone to Falconry Festival in 2012 um, may have seen this, um, where they release captive bred hubara and hare and gazelle, and you can go hunting them. And here they're using salukis, and they, they hunt hubara and so on. Hunting abroad, just to quickly cap on that, you can see some of the countries that, um, that are, they, they hunt. And you can see in perspective where um, Saudi Arabia, uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, UAE, I should say, are in proximity to them. Most of the falcons would go to Azerbaijan or um, Kazakhstan, some Morocco, and so on. Again, a quick recap, these are the, the species that we the hunted. The top left is the Kirawan, the stone curlew. Bottom right, uh, bottom left, thank you, um, is the Hubara and then the desert hare. And these are, the two of those animals were sacred. Here you see a Jir Shasheen and a, a, a Jir Falcon, the McKean's busted. It's a big bird and it's not, uh, you know, it's not something that's gonna give up easily too. They will they will fight on the ground. When it goes to a ground battle, it takes the strongest and most courageous falcon to deal with this, because they're gonna get a, a beating too, if they allow it. Um, so, uh, the, the, the stone curlew is a small bird, and I won't show you the video, but this was me in Azerbaijan hunting with them. Uh, we're running out of time, but um, these are a great bird to fly. I enjoyed flying them. They would do a ringing flight, and it was very much a spectator sport, a bit like duck hawking for us. Um, oh, and then, sorry, I'll go quickly. The little bustard, this is what we hunted in Azerbaijan, the Tetrix Tetrix. It's a small bus bustard species, very small, actually. It's like a sharp-tailed grouse. But these things are by far, I think, the most difficult prey for any long wing I've ever seen. I mean, these things can climb on their tail. We think geofalcons can climb. These things are unbelievable. And yet when they take off, they look a little moth-like, but they just sky out. And that's how they try to avoid the flights. And uh, I had a flight with, one, with my geoperegrine male on one of these that went for 25 kilometers. And uh, a customer showed us a video, which I have even on my phone today, of one that went 34 kilometers chasing it at 1,000 feet. 
over a village, over everything. And if we'd had normal modern, you know, normal telemetry, we would have lost it and said, oh, the transmitter failed. But with GPS, we could see everything. And, and it was just amazing. They're an incredibly difficult quarry to hunt. Um, here you can see the, you, with the pest passport, you can carry the, the bird on the plane. You just go wherever you want. You get off at the airport, they check it, and then you're off. You're in a, you're in a car and, um, and you're, you're, you're off to your hunting grounds, which is what a lot of the Arabs do. Uh, I think I'm here not making it work again. This is Kazakhstan, where you can see it's pretty bare. Now Azerbaijan, where we hunted um, the little bustard. Um, these are some of the hazards. Now, falconers are not the best drivers anyway, but th this is, this is uh, uh, I mean, seriously, th this is reality there. They're watching the falcon, they're driving, and nobody's looking what's up in front of them. And the, the guy on the far right, that's me, that's a Marshall vehicle. Um, driving in dunes is not easy. I think Robert knows about this one. At least there's no damage to the vehicle. I got over it, but when you come over a dune and then you see this big hole and you panic, you turn. Anyway, I got stuck. And it is no, some AMA, no, no motor company is going to come out and pull you out. So you rely on another Falcon to come. Um, of course, camels can be a bit of a hazard, um, but um, they're not very common. So the Falcon races I touched on, I just want to show you one video, which will kind of give you an idea quickly. And I can see John there looking at me. I don't want to look at him in the eye because he's going to tell me. Um, that video there is showing you a lineup of vehicles. It looks like a car dealership. Those are prizes for the, the races. And these races will have 5 million US dollars of prize money for them. And there's at least two, sometimes three or four, in just the UAE, and of course Saudi Arabia is now doing it, and Qatar and so on, this is big money. This is huge money. And in the early years, because the Arabs are very creative in ways of winning, um, one guy won 26 vehicles. I mean, he could open a dealership. And so, and there's prize money and, and, and big dollars involved in this, and so you wonder why there's so much hype on Falcons? This is it. It's huge money. Huge. Um, but it's actually a great event, and you can see in the top left, there's uh, spectators there, they're watching it, um, and um, it, it's all about the bragging rights and, and, and you know, w winning it. This, again, part of the race is, this is Sheikh Hamdan, the Crown Prince of Dubai's training area, and you can see this room, this, this long hallway is 300 meters, and then they come into this big area, you can, I don't know if you can see in that video, the, the, the falcon, but this is an air-conditioned building with sand, of course, which is easy to get there. Um, and um, there's another room, the other end, 300 meters long. And this thing is bigger than most aircraft hangars. And this is where they're training the birds early season that the breeders send over. And um, it's still 35 degrees outside. Anyway, I'm going to wrap it up because John's going to come over and rip the mic off me now. But um, the... I could go on, but this is nearly the last slide. Um, the only thing I would add is that um, the falcon uh, races, this is pigeon racing where they throw a pigeon and the falcons chase it. This is really fun because it's hard. These are not some barn pigeon. These are really uh, full uh, racing pigeons. Uh, they're, they're fast. And this shows you again the uh, the capabilities of the falcon. And then last but not least is um, conservation. And as I alluded to earlier on, um, the concept of wildlife conservation was very foreign up until recent years in the Middle East. And now some of the sheikhs and royal family members have gone to great expense to produce the birds that they'd almost wiped out, and including the Hubara and the Ar Arabian Oryx and so on. And now, for example, the Hubara is a, a should we say, a poster child for that conservation in uh, the Middle East, there's over 55,000 bred every year and released, not only within the UAE, but in Pakistan and Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan and Morocco. So they've done, they've, they've kind of woken up to the fact and they're spending a great deal of money in terms of trying to reintroduce those species. Anyway, that concludes my talk. Thank you very much for your patience and...
forward. Thank you. Thank you. We'll give you a question. All right, we've got time for one question while I fire up the next PowerPoint. You can meet me at the bar if you want tonight. I can tell you anything. There's a limited fee. Uh-oh. The next one. Oh, there, there we go. It's working now. Great presentation. Thank you so much. I, I think, I mean, you're a very good falconer. You go over there, you see all the different practices. A couple top things that you brought home and have tried to integrate into your own falconry now because of your experience there? Well, I think the biggest thing that I would take away from it is knowing the true potential of your falcon. I've realized now that we were a, a lid on a jam jar as to what we potentially could get from our birds. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing. The other thing is, is that they are incredibly good at manning their birds. Um, uh, there's different ways to look at that. I kind of like it, particularly if you get a passage bird. I like them on the edge where you're on that knife edge of, of losing control. Um, and of course, with telemetry, you, you can stand a chance of recovering that bird. It doesn't make up for poor falconry skills or husbandry, but uh, it certainly enables to see way more potential from those birds. So the things I would take away from it would be really just sort of opening my eyes to the true potential of it. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.